if you can for our morning worship service roads are pretty clear if you feel like getting out it is very cold out there 19 degrees so you might just want to stay warm and join us on our live stream at 11 o'clock on newbaptist.com if you join us for that if you join us as we're led in prayer by carl pemberton our heavenly father we just thank you for the glorious day you blessed us with we just thank you for glorious Time you've given to us the birth of Jesus Christ, the one who died on the cross for our sins. Lord, we just thank you for that. Our Heavenly Father, just bless those that on radio land that's not able to come to your house, Lord, that you would just be with their very special way. Be with our special music as Sherry and Becky does our special music. Just be with them, Lord, as we glorify your name. Be with Pastor Robbins who brings the message to us. Our Heavenly Father, just lead and guide us and watch over us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Carl. Appreciate Becky and pulling, <laughs> pulling together this morning with me to play Joy to the World. the world Jesus brings us joy to the world and God brings us joy to the world thank goodness through all the crazy times that we do have that our message this morning is Pastor Robin well it is good to be with you and uh, as you can see we are glad to be out of uh, at the tail end of 2020 all these weeks and we haven't had a uh, start quite like that one uh, and yet it's just a fitting ending uh, to 2020. 
Uh, are you ready to be done with 2020? Yes. <laughs> Most of the people I know can't wait to get to 2021. Most years at this time, I'm uh, talking and thinking about how fast the year went. You know, still writing 2020 on checks and stuff like that, but boy, not so this year. It seems that the pandemic has simply slowed time down. I wonder if the pandemic will ever be over, if we'll ever be able to turn the page on a new year. Well, with the vaccine now being distributed, I hope we can soon put this pandemic in the rearview mirror. Uh, but today, what I want to do is I'm going to step just a, a, away from uh, the normal lesson a little bit and talk about uh, and, and just focus on how can we uh, make 2021 better than 2020 or how can we make 2021 great? Uh, the truth is, uh, it has nothing to do with whether the pandemic's with us or not. Uh, and if it continues, I hope 2020 was a good year. Now, a difficult to be sure, but was a good year uh, for you. Uh, but as we try to focus our attention on making 2021 great, I want to focus on what's important and not what's trivial. So uh, the question is just what is important? Well, let me read something I found. Uh, it, it's called Things I Learned. In childhood, I learned you can't hide a piece of broccoli in a glass of milk. I learned that I like my teacher because she cries when we sing Silent Night. I learned that when I wave to people in the country, they stop what they're doing and wave back. In my teens, I learned that if you want to cheer yourself up, you should try cheering someone else up. I've learned that just when I get my room the way I like it, my mom makes me clean it up. In my teens, I learned that although it's hard to admit it, I'm secretly glad my parents are strict. In my 20s, I learned that silent company is often more healing than words of advice. In my 20s, I learned that brushing my child's hair is one of life's great pleasures. I learned that wherever I go, the world's worst drivers have followed me there. In my 30s, I learned that if someone says something unkind about me, I must live so that no one will believe it. In my 40s, I learned that the road to success and the road to happiness are two lanes on the same highway. And the toll you must pay is simply being true to yourself. I learned that children and grandparents are natural allies. And I learned that the greater a person's sense of guilt, the greater his need to cast blame on others. In my 50s, I learned that regardless of your relationship with your parents, you'll miss them terribly after they die. I learned that you can tell a lot about a man by the way he handles three things. A rainy day, lost luggage, and tangled Christmas tree lights. I've learned that making a living is not the same as making a life. And I've learned that if you want to do something positive for your children, try to improve your marriage. In my 60s, well, I learned that life sometimes gives you a second chance. I learned that you shouldn't go through life with catcher's mitts on both hands. You need to be able to throw something back. I've learned that if you pursue happiness, it will elude you. But if you focus on your family, the needs of others, your work, meeting new people, and doing the very best you can, happiness will find you. I've learned that whenever you decide something with kindness, you usually make the right decision. In my 70s, I learned that even though I have pains, I don't have to be one. In my 80s, I learned that every day you should reach out and touch someone. People love that human touch, holding hands, a warm hug, or just a friendly pat on the back. And I, folks, I honestly can't wait till we can get back to that after this pandemic beyond us. And in my 90s, I learned I still have a lot to learn. Well, a lot of wisdom in those, isn't it? We laughed and we laughed here and laughed at each other. But a lot of wisdom. The question that I continue to find myself asking is, what does God expect of me?
What's really important to him? What's important to God should be important to me, and if it becomes important to me, then making 2021 better than 2020 will just naturally happen. But what does God expect of me? That's the focus uh, of the message and of the scripture today. So if you have your copy of God's Word, you can turn to Luke chapter uh, 10. We're going to look at verses, just uh, four verses, verses 25 through 28. And it says this, And behold, a lawyer stood up and put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, What's written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor is yourself. And Jesus said to him, You've answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Pray with me, would you? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth that is there. God, I thank you for the wisdom it gives to us that as we live life, we can begin to see uh, what we can learn from you. But I pray now that you would take this passage and you would speak to our hearts. And in these few moments we have together, that you would show us how we can uh, make 2021 much different in our relationship with you much better, how we can make an impact on our world, and, oh, God, how we can finally put 2020 behind us and move forward looking to you. Now, open our eyes and ears to see and to hear what you have for us today. Open our heart to understand it, and then give us courage to obey you. We pray in your name. Amen. Well, there were two commands given in this passage that we just read. Jesus uh, there has uh, referred this lawyer back to the law and these two commands, and those two commands are, are fairly simple. Uh, they're simple to understand. They are not simple to live out. Uh, he says that we are to love God and to love our neighbor. In this statement, I think we have the keys to life and eternal life. Here the, are God's priorities for us clearly revealed and what's important to him. These are the keys to making 2021 great in every sense. So let's look at each of those commands. First, he says we are to love God. That's what the law says, to love God. To love God as your very own God. This is a personal relationship, not a distant one. God is not impersonal, far out in space somewhere, distant and removed, uh, just looking kind of out over there and saying, well, okay, there's the world and there's so-and-so and so-and-so, and kind of disinterested. But God is personal, ever so close, and we are able to personally uh, be involved with God on a face-to-face -face basis. Now, we won't see his face. Scripture says that no one has seen God and lived. But we will be able to talk with God back and forth directly. The command is to love the Lord your God. Loving God is active, alive, not dead and inactive. We are therefore to maintain a personal relationship with God that is alive and active. Jesus says to love God with all your being. He breaks it down, the law does, down into three parts, your heart, your soul, and your mind. But you notice here in Luke, he also adds with all your strength. Our main responsibility is to maintain a loving relationship with God. So what does I, uh, developing that kind of a relationship, what does that involve? Well, I think there are a number of things. But first, if I want to, divide, to develop a loving relationship with God, it first involves commitment and loyalty. Uh, that this relationship will be singular and exclusive. It doesn't allow lustful behavior with others, much like our relationship with our, with our spouses should be here. It's focused on developing and growing that relationship. And how do we develop and grow in our love for God? Well, first, like other relationships, it begins with spending time getting to know Him. Uh, as you were dating, uh, 
Uh, you remember those uh, late nights talking together, learning from each other, just couldn't get enough of each other's uh, physical presence, not wanting to leave, but knowing you had to. You just didn't want to. You couldn't get enough of each other. That's the way we begin a relationship with God. We want to spend time with Him. And the more time we spend with Him, the more time we want to. And the better we get to know Him, the more we want to get to know Him. That's what the Lord desires. Time with you, getting to know Him better. He already knows all about you. Understand, God knows everything about you. But He wants you to begin to learn more and more about Him. Now, how do we do that? Well, it takes time. There are no instant or easy relationships or so solutions. It will take disciplined effort on your part. It takes time. Uh, there's no instant maturity. Uh, most of us have that uh, ha have difficulty uh, with being patient in things and watching things grow. Uh, most of us, uh, you know, are like me. You know, I pray and I say, Lord, I want patience and I want it right now. Uh, and the Lord's answer to that prayer generally is to put me in a place where I have to demonstrate patience. And I say, no, 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 that's not the way I meant this. I meant I want you to give me patience. I don't want to have to work for it. Well, it takes time. And my relationship with God takes time. But how do I, what do I do? What's discipline? Well, I need to read. I spend time reading the Bible. That's where he speaks to you. That's where uh, he shows us how to live and how to live life to the fullest. It's where we get to know a little bit about God is as we read the Word because God's Word, the Bible, is his self-revelation of uh, to us. He reveals himself to us by what he tells us in the Word. But it's just not reading the Word. There's also praying, and that's where we talk with God and, and we communicate with God and we tell him what's on our heart. Uh, and it's where in silence we listen, where God can then uh, speak to us. Now, I'm not saying God speaks out loud, uh, although there are times when it seems as if he spoke out loud, but it's not. But there is that communication where it's not just me telling God what I want, but it's also listening for God to speak to my heart. Then there's time with others, with other Christians in worship and fellowship. That's where the church comes in. That's where getting with a small group of believers throughout the week comes in. You want to spend time with each other. And in so doing, you encourage each other. Uh, you encourage each other to, to develop further relationship with God. Uh, you encourage each other to, to love and good deeds, we're told. Uh, those kinds of things, but that happens in, a, in, in smaller groups. You know, you simply cannot relate to everyone in a church. It's too large. But if you get in a smaller grouping within, within that church or, or within your, your uh, group of Christians, uh, whether it's a Sunday school class or a small group or whatever, an affinity group, a small Bible study, those kinds of things where you can commit yourself to knowing God and growing together, that's really important. There's also a fifth, and that's obedience. It's important uh, where we do what God says. We do what he commands and trust that he's faithful and able to meet our needs. Whatever God commands you, we are to do. Also involved in building a relationship is trust and respect for the person loved. It's loving the person for who they are. You see, God, uh, we love God because of himself and because it is he who loves us. And we love him because of who he is. We cannot try to make him something he's not, although people try that all the time. Some see God as a doting grandfather, others as a tyrant, and even others as a disinterested party. But all of those are false views. We cannot make him what he's not. We love him for who he is. The God who gave his only son at Christmas, whose birth we celebrate, to die that we might live. But also, in a relationship, we have to give and we have to surrender ourselves. This means to give ourselves, to surrender to one another. It's, and it's not just to take from each other, but as I give, I surrender for the good of the other. The scriptures talk about being in submission to one another. Submit to one another, the scripture says. 
And to submit does not mean that I am less than that person. Because the scripture says that Jesus submitted to the will of the Father. And to say that Jesus is less than the Father is simply heresy. So when I submit myself to my wife or to the people I care about, it does not mean I'm less than they are. It means that I'm loving them in a special way. And then I need to know and to share. The desire to know and to share, to be learning and growing and working and serving together. All of those things. This is what God wants in a relationship. And our, in our response uh, is what he blesses. He protects, he guides, he provides, he forgives. That leads to experiencing life as he intended it to be lived. We are to love God as our very own God and to develop that love. And most of the time, uh, we take God so for granted and we wonder why love wanes or whether we, why we feel like God is distant. And it's because we have not put in uh, the time that it takes to develop that relationship with him. But then he says, second, we are to love our neighbor. Now, this is not, a, not na optional, but it naturally flows right out of the first command. It's a demonstration that we understand uh, and are doing the first command. If I love God, I am naturally going to love the people around me. Well, what does loving your neighbor mean? Well, it means giving mercy to all who need mercy. Being kind and patient and compassionate. It means to share Christ with them. And it doesn't mean that, that you're being obnoxious or you're going to beat them over the head with your Bible, those kind of things. It simply means when given the opportunity, you, say, you share with them the difference Christ has made in your life. And because he made a difference in your life, he can make a difference in theirs. But we are to be kind and patient. The uh, King James, I think, for the word patient, uses the, the, the term long-suffered or long-suffering. I had a professor once who said, you've not long suffered till you've been long bothered. But we're to be patient with those folks around us. We are to love God. And we're to love our neighbors. We are to go out of our way to love the people around us. And particularly those who aren't so lovable. And it seems to me that when I seek to live this out, God brings those unlovable people right to the forefront and says, these are the ones I want you to love. I want you to show my love to them. Show them grace. Show them mercy. Tell them about Jesus. Go out of your way. Like I said, easy to read, easy to understand, tough to do. But in the passage also, there were two great questions that we are supposed to ask. The first was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus, and then the second is, who's my neighbor? Uh, Jesus clearly answered both of these questions and the answer he gave, uh, and uh, that's the answer that uh, came out of the law that we saw this morning. He shows us that loving God takes effort and commitment. He showed us that loving others involves some personal sacrifice. Well, what are you to do in 2021? Well, many of you have already done the first. Uh, you're a Christ follower. You're working on the second, loving the people God brings across your path. Uh, now, I will tell you uh, that uh, some have looked at this passage, and I think in a right way, because when the lawyer in the passage asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? Uh, he's asking it so he can check it off his list. And see, he has a view of God that says, if I just do these things, God will bless me. And it's not about a relationship. It's not about developing that. It's about if I just check these things off my list, uh, then God will bless me and I'll have this relationship with him. And all I'm saying to you is that's not what that's not the intent of the passage. And so if you're asking, well, who's my neighbor? So I can go out, go out and love him and say, okay, God, I did this. That's not the point. You've missed it because at that point, your relationship with God is based on your works. And I got news. If you put it based on your works rather than his, you're always going to be disappointed. 
God's always going to seem to be far away, and you're going to be depressed. You're going to be oppressed. You're going to you're going to feel down. You're going to feel distant, feel distant from God because you can't do it. But when my relationship with God says, "Who's my neighbor?" and people come in front of me and I love them with the love of God, then the more I love folks the way God loves them, the more I sense God's love in my own life, and the closer I draw to Him, and I move forward. That's how I'm transformed. That's how I am changed to be more like Jesus. I know that my life sh uh, should be changed, but when I don't sense God working in my life at all, it's generally because I'm trying to do all the work. Let me give you three things that you can do that will allow the Holy Spirit to begin to transform you. That in 2021, your life can be transformed. First, spend some time reading and reflecting on God's Word. Commit to reading the Bible each day. I would tell you to try to read it through in 2021. Uh, commit to reading it each day. There are a lot of reading plans available. Uh, you can get online and just type in Bible reading plan and you'll get a whole page of things. Uh, find one you like. Use it. The version Bible app has plenty to choose from. And if you set the, uh, the settings, it will come up each day to remind you to do your Bible reading. But also with the version, if reading is difficult for you, put in a... a Put in a, a set of headphones, and it will read it back to you. So you can listen and hear. And I'm always just reminded of Romans that says uh, that, you know, uh, that it is the hearing of the word. Not just the reading, but the hearing of the word that brings faith. So you can hear it, and you listen. And I will tell you that that's what I have done the last year. I have put my headphones on every morning. And I listen and read at the same time. I follow along as I read and do my Bible reading uh, through uh, the Bible. Uh, and it is wonderful to hear it and to read it. But find it. And that's the U version. It's free. Personally, I use the Life Journal reading plan. It's a one year uh, plan. Uh, the one year chronological Bible plan is another that I've used. Both are structured. That means they tell you exactly what to read. And if you use the U version of the Bible, it takes you right, it, it does it automatically. You don't have to go looking for it. It just reads it just the way it's supposed to. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes each day. Uh, and as you spend time in God's Word, you begin to build up a reservoir of God's Word that He can use in you when you need it. You know, when I get in a crisis situation, I don't want to say, well, well, can you hold up? Let me get my Bible and see if I can find that verse. No, when I have read it, 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 it's a reservoir within me that God can use. Get in a small group. Begin to share your life with other believers. Uh, there's nothing you can do that will enhance your spiritual life any more than being with believers who will encourage you. So get in a small group. Again, it might be a Sunday school class. might be some other kind of group. Volunteer to help in a ministry at a local church, at a local, uh, uh, you know, there are other ministries in town that simply need volunteers. Don't be afraid. And then find a neighbor to love. Make a difference in someone's life for Jesus' sake this year. Find one person who you will influence. So as we close, let me ask you this. Will you love God, and will you influence one person this year for God? If you do those things, you'll make 2021 great. Pray with me, would you? Our Father, again, I give you thanks. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the opportunity we have to be transformed. And, oh God, for the work you want to do in us but also for the work you want to do through us. So God, as we move into 2021, teach us to love you with all that we are, to spend time getting to know you better, and then to love those folks that you bring across our path. We call them neighbors. They might be family. Oh God, but to love folks the way you would love them. And oh God, if we'll do that, 
2021 will be great in your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.